Thank you, Sandy. Special thanks to Nick Meyer for the sponsorship. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The uh, topic, as you know, is printing power, the central bank and the state. And uh, there we were watching a whole movie last night, and we've heard a lot already about the Fed. And so you come in in the morning, and here I am, talking about, <laughs> talking about the Fed. But uh, this one is really talking about the function of central banks in general, uh, and something very important about them, which is how they fit in to uh, and enhance and support the power of the state and are an essential part uh, of the government. So printing power, that has a double meaning. I worked on this. Printing power, that is to say you have the power of printing, which the Federal Reserve uh, has in spades, and so do all modern uh, central banks. And um, the uh, Federal Reserve, for example, prints up $2.3 trillion in currency that we all use, which is all financing the government, financing the Fed itself and thereby the government. Uh, but the other meaning of this phrase is printing power. That is to say that the printing of the central bank creates power for the state. The whole topic of our excellent conference, the power of the state, and essential is the fact that you could print a lot of this, uh, a lot of this power. Because um, what does a state need? It needs to have money. It needs to have money to pay the soldiers, to buy the munitions, to pay all of the uh, all of the employees to carry out all their programs, to give money to their friends and favored constituencies. Uh, and Joe, it needs to have money to pay all those economists that the state has now, <laughs> that the state has now uh, acquired. Uh, so $2.3 trillion in currency, and on top of that, the Fed prints in a metaphorical way uh, four, uh, point one, well, Sorry, four point one trillion dollars in uh, in deposits, which are printed by simply crediting accounts, as we know. So if you put that uh, together, that's six point four trillion dollars as of the beginning of October, twenty twenty four, that the Fed is is financing uh, is financing the government with. And what does that what does that money raised by the currency and the deposits go to? Well, it goes to buying the debt of the Treasury. Um, uh, the current Fed, as of this month, has $7 trillion in assets. Of that, $4.3 trillion is the Treasury debt that they, they buy and create the money to buy, and two point three is the currency they create. So that's uh, $6.6 trillion of, uh, on the Fed's balance sheet. Out of the $7 trillion in total assets, go to finance uh, the state. Now, because central banks print power for governments and the state. All countries, now virtually all countries, have them. Because if you're a government, there's nothing handier for you than to have your own central bank. And so every government virtually in the world uh, now has one. And what is the first mandate of every central bank? We hear a lot about the dual mandate of the Fed in the Act. It's, as many of you may know, it's actually a triple mandate. It has to do with with uh, stable prices, which they reinterpret to mean perpetual inflation. It has to do uh, with with employment, with uh, interest rates on long term debt. We hear a lot about how the Fed uh, works on financial stability. Uh, financial regulation, coordination around the world. There's nothing thicker than the brotherhood of these central banks, by the way. Very important. Uh, but, the, but nowhere, nowhere in the material that the Federal Reserve publishes for its own public relations, and by the way, nobody is better at public relations than the Fed. They are, they are brilliant at it. Uh, but nowhere in there do you find their real first mandate. And the real 
first mandate of every central bank, which is to finance the government of which they're a part. That's the real uh, reason they're there, just as we saw by lending the government money in various in various ways. Now, at peak Fed, which was in March 2022, uh, after the, the vast uh, expansion of the government, uh, and of the Fed, the, the Fed had assets of $8.9 trillion, which is really uh, staggering. And out of that, $8.4 trillion was lent to the government in one form or another. Now, uh, the modern Fed, which is, which is something that was very radical, in fact, also buys mortgages of government mortgage companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So you really have three parts. You have a kind of triangle here. The U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Gov- uh, the U.S. mortgage operations, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the Fed make this financial financing triangle. Uh, and of course, so the Fed uh, lends the government money, but it helps the government in another way, as we all know, which is taxing by inflation, since inflation transfers resources and purchasing power from the people uh, to the government, and here's the really handy thing, which we don't always focus on. Uh, in levying this inflation tax on the people, you don't have to pass any legislation. You don't, you don't have to enact taxes. You don't have to appropriate any money. You don't have to have any legislative activity. Your central bank just raises resources for the government through creating inflation by its mastery of printing as it displays its printing power and as it prints power. Uh, so this is, uh, is key uh, to the power of the, uh, of the state. Um, one more word on economists. Uh, one place that economists have really taken over, and many of us are economists, and more, more power to us, although I myself am a former student of philosophy, uh, but is the Fed itself. The Fed itself is, is said to be, at least, and I guess it's true, the biggest employer of PhD economists in the world. The number uh, usually said to be something like 400 or 500 PhD economists who work for the Fed. Well, this gives the, an interesting conflict of interest for the, uh, for the economics profession which we might think about, of, uh, of liking the Fed as, as, uh, as, their, biggest, uh, as their biggest employer. Uh, I want to take a quick look at the history of central banking to see this very close connection between the central bank and the power of the state, and I thought we might enjoy reviewing a few examples of this. First, I will take up the foundation of the quintessential central bank. At least it was the quintessential central bank before the Fed uh, became the leading central bank, namely the Bank of England. Uh, The Bank of England was by far the greatest and most important central bank in the world uh, up to the First World War uh, when the Europeans foolishly committed suicide uh, with the war and, among other things, destroyed the gold standard. But let's think about how the, uh, how the Bank of England was created. Uh, Bernard Schull, S-H-U-L-L, wrote what is, in my mind, a great book on the Fed. He called it the fourth branch, this other part of government, a, 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 I think a terrific book. And he reminds us in there that in 1694, which is the date of the founding of the, of the Bank of England, the British Parliament desperately needed money to finance England's wars with Louis XIV. Parliament accepted a novel plan to establish a bank that would raise capital and promptly lend it to the government at a bargain rate. Uh, In return, this bank would be given various charter privileges. Thus, Wright Scholl, the Bank of England came into into existence as as an instrument of war finance. This is a tremendous historical lesson. The bank comes into existence 
uh, as an instrument of war finance. And as this instrument was extremely successful, uh, William McNeil, a noted historian, and his, his interesting book, The Pursuit of Power, uh, over a thousand years, he starts uh, in the 11th century and goes up to the 20th. Uh, this is a general historian, picks up this importance of the Bank of England. Uh, he writes, the English invented an efficient centralized credit mechanism for financing war by founding the Bank of England. The result was to assure Great Britain of easy naval superiority throughout the 18th century. So here's the link of how we print uh, power. Now, uh, that went through the uh, Napoleonic Wars and the wars with France. So on the other side of, of, that, uh, of that great uh, set of wars between England and France were the French. Uh, they didn't get around to their central bank uh, until about 100 years later when Napoleon created the Bank of France as, uh, as part of his regime. And Napoleon, in creating the Bank of France, said, I want a bank who will lend me money when I want it. And he was so right. That's exactly why the government uh, wants this central bank. This was not lost on uh, perceptive Americans. <coughs> Excuse me. Alexander Hamilton, uh, during the revolution... Uh, wrote, Great Britain is indebted for the immense efforts it has been able to make in so many illustrious and successful wars, essentially to that vast fabric of credit created by the Bank of England. And of course, he went on to create the bank of the first bank of the United States. Uh, and then uh, later, of course, uh, we got uh, the Fed. Um, I have a very, if I have time in the end, I'm going to tell you my favorite Bank of England story, but just now uh, I'm going to uh, move on to the, uh, to the creation of the Fed. Now, when the Fed was created, the, it was uh, just before the outbreak of the disastrous uh, First World War. Um, and, and when it got set up in, in 1914, it wasn't thought of by the government as a, a particularly uh, high-ranking part of the government, far behind the Treasury Department, for example. Its uh, chairman was, by law, the Secretary of the Treasury, and it met in the, uh, in the Treasury building uh, for many years. The uh, early on, there was a state dinner, and the uh, directors of the Federal Reserve Board, turns out, objected to the Secretary of the Treasury at their placement at the dinner, at the low order at which they came in, and where they were going to be seated. Secretary of the Treasury went to the President, Woodrow Wilson, and said, well, we have this problem. The Federal Reserve is, you know, is not getting enough prestige at where they're coming into the dinner. What do you think? And Woodrow Wilson said, they can come in after the fire department for all I care. <laughs> Little did he know that they would become the chief financial fire department, as we saw in our movie last night, of the entire world, uh, as well as uh, in Jim Grant's uh, witty rendition, the, uh, the, the leading fire, uh, financial arsonist. Um, so to repeat, if, if you're the state, uh, and the state is always interested in expanding its power, one of the things you, you really like to have is ready deficit financing. You need money to carry out all your programs, your wars, and, uh, and all, your, all your domestic uh, wars. And uh, you, you're likely to spend more than you've got. And maybe the borrower, or maybe the lenders are wanting higher rates than you uh, wish to pay, or maybe they won't lend to you at all. So it's really handy to have the central bank. Now, most recently, uh, we saw this uh, in the financial crisis, uh, which came along with the COVID health crisis. As we know, this combined crisis morphed into a terrific 
financial bust and tremendous amounts uh, of state um, financing to get through it, very, which put the debts and the deficits up to the level of a big war, up, up to the level of the financing of the Second World War. And who, of course, the Fed was there loyally. So along with the COVID crisis, we got peak Fed, and peak Fed had assets of $8.9 uh, trillion, as we uh, said at the peak, which was uh, March 2022. Uh, of which 5.7 trillion were treasury debt, treasury uh, bonds and notes, and 2.7 <coughs> trillion were government mortgage securities for a grand total of uh, 8.4 trillion uh, of, uh, of financing for the government from printing power. Now, uh, we see this before, right after Woodrow Wilson sort of dismissed the concerns of the Federal Reserve that they weren't getting enough uh, prestige. The uh, a few years later, uh, the United States itself entered World War I, and the Federal Reserve made its reputation and its name by its activity and its success in helping to finance the American participation in the First World War. And when it was all done, this is what the United States Treasury said about the Fed. Without this system, it would have been impossible to finance the tremendous credits required to assist foreign governments making common cause against Germany and to take care of the extraordinary expenditures entailed by our part in the war. Well, you, you might argue it would have been better not to have been able to finance these war expenditures and not to have been in the war. But, we, but that is the US Treasury's praise of the Fed for carrying out its fundamental uh, role at that time by which the Fed really made its reputation. As I said, the Federal Reserve Board at the same time, stated, from the outset, the Federal Reserve recognized its duty to cooperate unreservedly with the government to provide funds as needed for the war. It freely conceded that the great national emergency made it necessary to suspend the application of well-recognized principles of economics and finance. <laughs> So there, there you have it, very early in the life uh, of the Fed, as, uh, as, as clearly uh, as, as you could state it. All right, now I do have a minute, so I'm coming back uh, to, the, to my favorite Bank of England story. It's 1914. The First World War started off. The Bank of England is the leading and greatest central bank in the world and has been for some time. And in 1914, interestingly enough, it helps the British state, which wants to get its expeditionary army into action in France, it, by, by, by the Bank of England, by publicly lying, defrauding the public, and secretly lending money to support the state. This is a very little known effort, but it's, I think it's marvelously illustrative of this fundamental link between the central bank uh, and the power of the state. And here's, here's how it happened. At the beginning of the crisis of the First World War, um, the Bank of England, knowing it was going to have tremendous, uh, I'm sorry, the British government, knowing it was going to have tremendous expenses from the war, got set up a big bond uh, issue uh, to raise money. However, this bond issue raised less than a third of its funds when it was offered to the market, to the investors. So the Bank of England secretly uh, claiming that it was being done in the names of individuals, bought the bonds, which couldn't be sold, 
uh, to the market uh, and, and hid it, short and lied about it, uh, secretly plugging this, uh, this shortfall uh, in the issue. Uh, and then the government announced and uh, was quoted in the Financial Times under the headline, Oversubscribed War Loan. <laughs> when in fact, it was made up secretly uh, by the Bank of England. This was uh, kept secret. Uh, a name familiar in economics uh, to the Mises Institute is John Maynard Keynes. Keynes was an advisor to the Treasury, as you know. Later on, he wrote a secret memo to His Majesty's Treasury Department in which he described this Bank of England action and this bond issue as compelled by circumstances uh, and that these actions had, quote, been concealed from the public by a masterful manipulation, unquote. A masterful manipulation helped get the British government involved in uh, the incredible disaster of the First World War. I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful example. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's just, uh, let's just sum it up. Uh, the central bank has been a terrific invention to enhance the power of the state from 1694 to now by printing power and the central banks cannot be understood without this insight. Thank you.